Thank you, Don. And congratulations, Nadia. Well, good morning. You know, I'm honored to provide an address today on behalf of the phenomenal class of 1991. Before I begin, let me apologize to those of you seated in the first few rows here and maybe those of you to my, my right and my left. The glare from my bald head can <laughs> be a bit distracting and I'd suggest you not stare directly into the light. I can't be held responsible for any temporary blindness or vision impairment. If you do get uncomfortable, uh, I just suggest you close your eyes and listen to the smooth sound of my voice and you'll be okay. Well, I want to recognize and congratulate all of you who are celebrating milestone reunion years, but a few comments to uh, a couple of the classes here in the room. Uh, class of 2011, not sure where you are. I think you might be in the back somewhere. Good to see you. This is your first big reunion, and it only gets better. Class of 2006, welcome to 10 years out. Keep the momentum going. Class of 2001, thanks for being here. I know you weren't sure if you'd come back just five years after being here before. Class of 1996, good to see you. Yeah, the, the, the big one staring you right in the face, so get ready. And class of 1966. Yeah. You, uh, you make us proud. You exemplify all that is pure, lovely, and of good report. For those of you celebrating milestone reunion years beyond your 50th, my goodness, you each are treasures whom we are honored to celebrate with, and it is indeed a joy to be in your presence. And to the class of 1991, I provide you with these famous words from a renowned poet from Oakland, California. We are too legit, too legit to quit. <laughs> so congratulations on 25 years of uncommon success. So here we are 25 years later. I can remember arriving on campus on a hot summer day in 1987 and moving into a room on the South Quad during orientation week just prior to rush. My family and I drove to a recently opened Walmart for a last run on supplies. The store was crowded with students and parents shopping as if no other store on the planet would be open the day after. <laughs> it was part of the experience of going off to college and I still get giddy when I walk into the Greencastle Walmart. That is the only Walmart though that I walk into <laughs> and uh, get giddy about. We were a different class. Uh, a diverse class, diverse racially, socioeconomically, geographically a little less Midwestern, and more likely to challenge traditional norms. The DePaul ran a small article on September 29, 1987, about this class being more diverse than any other class at DePaul. It was certainly more racially diverse to the extent that 26 black students was a big deal at the time. But even more interestingly, Tom Arner, who was Associate Dean of Admissions, was quoted as saying, the incoming freshmen generally were more politically aware and are interested in the issues outside the DPU bubble. I, know how, I don't know how old that damn bubble is. It's been around forever. <laughs> you gotta work on busting the bubble, Dr. McCoy. True to those words about political awareness, our DePaul experience was characterized by vigorous and healthy debates about global race relations. You may recall the, the calls for and the resultant divestiture by DePaul and South African apartheid supported interests. And the police brutality of four Los Angeles police officers who beat Rodney King. All of this in the midst of our own campus struggles about diversity and about what it meant to become an inclusive community. We debated politics and some protested during the visit of our distinguished alumnus Dan Quayle after President Bush's veto of a civil rights bill. 
We debated the merits of the Gulf War and some protested the beginning of Operation Desert Storm. We argued about the environment, we argued about deferred rush, we argued about same-sex dorms, and we argued about same-sex floors on the dorms, in the dorms. We argued about centralized mailboxes in the union building. <laughs> we argued about food served in the broken spoke in the terrace room and the dress codes there. Some of us even argued about whether President Bottoms' Audi was too flashy of a vehicle for a college president. <laughs> and whether then Vice President for Academic Affairs, Fred Solander, should be allowed to ride his bicycle on the sidewalks. <laughs> we debated everything, and through it all, we had a rich, and has been said, civil discourse. Even though when the exchanges got heated or ridiculously tiresome or frustrating, if you were paying attention, you might actually have learned something from someone who had a different perspective, experience, or opinion. Sadly, I think the students today, and even some of us who have the benefit of experience and an enlightened education, have become less civil in our discourse. Social media and news theater only serve to push us further apart. Surely, MSNBC and Fox News can be trusted authorities to fill gaps in our views on current affairs. Who needs independent thought and critical analysis when you've got Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Sadly, our smartphones and our choices of news media only serve to affirm how dumb we've become. It's an interesting time to be alive, and even more interesting for those of us in the class of 1991. Before Gwen Stefani was making her big comeback in music and television, we knew her as just a girl in the world. Now another girl in the world has made history as the first woman presidential nominee in a major political party. And uh, we'll just have to see. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is king of Hollywood. His kids are nuts, but that's a different story. <laughs> We've seen technology move at warp speed as we grew up on Apple computers, and now our phones and our watches are thousands times more powerful than the computers we used as undergraduates. Remember the VAX, that mainstream prehistoric monstrosity of a computer that had us all texting one another across campus on monochrome CRT screens. That was Twitter circa 1987. <laughs> when I consider our lives now, the blessing it is to be alive now, even with the aches and the pains and the bald heads, bad backs, soft middles, still a blessing. What strikes me, though, is a role that we play as leaders and people of influence by virtue of our age and stage in life. We've become members of the sandwich generation. We're there for parents and others who were there to raise us, and we're raising our own or playing roles in the lives of other young people who we care about. The decisions we make and the influence that we exert across all the generations should not be taken for granted. As an HR executive, I'm constantly, constantly reminded that there are five generations of employees in the workplace. The traditionalists are still there, still contributing, and just happy that we acknowledge their wisdom and their experience. The boomers are very present in the workplaces, and with retirement looming, they're concerned about the extent to which their retirement lifestyle can be sustained, given market volatility over the last several years. We exers are a mix of activists, entrepreneurs, and individuals who have a primary loyalty to ourselves and our families, but understand the importance of institutions and organizations and adjust our loyalties accordingly. Millennials are nipping at our heels, all of us, and wondering when we'll get out of the way so they can fix everything that we, we did wrong. <laughs> Generation Z remains to be defined as the oldest are just turning 20, but they are more digitally immersed than any generation before, and understand how to balance personal privacy with the online universe. The point is that we, the class of 1991, are in roles of authority and influence where we have to manage these very different groups of people and all their individual needs. Like that class that entered DePauw on a sunny summer day in 1987, our diversity, your diversity, and potential change for impact remains evident today. 
So I challenge each of us to leverage our individual diversity and our potential to affect change as we reflect on our lives 25 years after DePaul and what things might look like 25 years from now. I challenge you to affect the future by mentoring a young person. We benefited from formal and informal mentors during, after, and before our time at DePaul. Your lifelong association with professors, faculty, and administrators is proof of this fact. The generations behind us are hungry for mentorship, but some struggle with the norms associated with networking and communication formalities that existed prior to technology that wasn't so widely available when we were coming up. Meet them where they are, respect their reality, technical savvy, savvy, and teach them some of the art of what it means to have old school professionalism. I challenge you to affect the present by being models of discourse, civil discourse. We can disagree without being disagreeable. Political awareness and an informed perspective on current issues are just a few of the foundations of our liberal arts education. We are leaders who serve others in every field of endeavor. So use your leadership to challenge others to think, grow, and contribute. We can have awkward, difficult, and uncomfortable conversations while maintaining respect for others and safeguarding individual dignity. And I challenge you to engage your past by getting more involved with the PAW and developing meaningful relationships across the company of university graduates. Life after DePaul is rich with experiences and connections to alumni across the ages. When I see folks like Bing Davis, class of 59 on campus, we reconnect like old friends and it belies the fact that he graduated 32 years earlier than I did. When I see an alum that I may have met only a year ago back on campus or at a DePaul event, we establish our rapport and enjoy that moment thoroughly. Our experiences and love for this institution are truly rich and become even richer when deepened by the friendship of others who represent different times in the institution's history. Experience your legacy in full. As for today, this day, let's just relish being here now, right now. Health, wisdom, peace, joy. May you have them all in grand abundance. Congratulations and God's blessings, class of 1991. Thank you, Jay.